Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you again. Um, ooh, I'm a little low. Hang on, let me uh, let me fix that real quick. Let me bring myself up so you can actually see me. How about that? Is that better? That's eh, that's good enough. All right. So, um, uh, hopefully, you can see now. Uh, migrating a monolith to uh, cloud native, uh, the summoning box you you di didn't know about. That is actually really annoying. Hang on, let me bring that back down. I see myself, and it's it's driving me crazy. What can I say? There we go. Perfect. And yes, hi, my name is JJ Asgar, and I'm a developer advocate for the IBM Cloud. Um, I really do have the email address of awesome at ibm.com. So yes, you can absolutely send me an email there, um, and I will respond. Um, and you can find me on Twitter, uh, at JJ Asgar, um, where I usually tweet around random different things, tech stuff, and uh, also when I stream, um, and uh, a podcast I'm involved in too. So uh, find me there. Um, so yeah. So your company has finally decided to uh, move to the cloud native ecosystem. Congratulations. Awesome. That's great to hear. Um, you've landed on containerization as your first step. You know, you need to do this and you've heard all you need to do is containerize your first app and then push it to Kubernetes, OpenShift or Nomad and the cost savings will just come. You've done this and honestly, well, things haven't really gone as well as planned. Some of the tech you did, you, uh, some of the tech you, you didn't do, it didn't do what you expected. And wait, what do you mean OPEX has gone up? Um, OPEX means operational expense, if you didn't know that term. Simply said, the promise of containerization or migrating, a, a cloud, cloud uh, migrating to the cloud native ecosystem can be a lie if you don't do your homework. And sadly, most corporations don't. Most, corporate, most companies don't. In this talk, I'll explain, explain a few gotchas with a, a few, more than a few, enterprises in the guise of Asgar Labs hit moving towards this cloud native eco world in cloud native world. And hopefully you'll learn from their mistakes. So you don't trip down this path and be more comfortable and get closer to that promise that cloud native brings to you. And again, if you guys are, or if all y'all have any questions and yes, I say y'all because I am a Texan, um, have questions. I do have it over on the corner, so I have no problem with answering anything that pops up. So what is Asgar Labs? Asgar Labs is a multinational tech conglomerate that bought hard into the VM ecosystem. It makes ones and zeros like no other company. But honestly, notice it was falling behind. In all seriousness, Asgar Labs is just a collection of different companies I've, seen, I've taken stories from. And I saw the same issues over and over and over again. And yes, Asgar Labs is a fake company. And no, they're not hiring, sorry. And I will call, I, I, I do my best to make sure and I don't mention company names and, you know, it's, it's one of those things you've got to be kind of careful about, but <laughs> I do my best saying Asgar Labs instead of random Fortune 50 company, cough, cough. That was supposed to be a joke. So what did Asgar Labs think or what did they thought they needed to do? Like every company that I talked to that I came across and they, they, ha they, they have this idea in their mind. They only thought they could just take their, their plan from migration to the physical data center or co-location to the VM ecosystem. They used the same, same technique they used their monolithic applications to the cloud native. Bare metal to VMs is the same as VMs to containers, right? You'd be amazed on how many times I have this conversation where they spent all this time moving from bare metal or physical machines and they're like, hey, we got a bunch of VMware stuff. We threw ESXi in all our machines. That's the same concept, right? We can just like rub some Chef or Puppet or whatever on top of it and everything will be great. So yeah, you know, why can't I just take my VMs and take my Chef cookbooks or my Puppet Manifest or my Ansible playbooks, turn those into containers and throw this up on Kubernetes? Well, I'm here to tell you there's more to this story. So no, the TLDR, uh, bare metal to VMs is not <laughs> the same as VMs to containers. So let's talk about where I usually come into this conversation. And you, I'm, 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 I come into the conversation with the different Asgar Labs companies or Asgar Labs subsidiaries, I'll call it both ways, when they've had a few successful migrations, which honestly I beg to differ. They're nowhere near where they thought they could have been for the, how much time and effort they put in to the project. 
I come in as the cloud native person and ask some simple but very, very tough pointed questions at the very beginning. The advantage of being a developer advocate is I get to talk to so many different swaths of society. And with being that, I get to, I get to ask, well, I come in as the expert to be able to have these conversations with sometimes people who've been there for 20 plus years. And I come as the young buck, granted I do have quite a bunch of gray in my ear, my, my, uh, my beard here, but I do come in asking these questions that people genuinely don't think about. So let me, let me ask those straightforward questions now because they're deceptively hard to answer these things. <laughs> the first one is my favorite. <laughs> Who containerized your app? Now imagine me sitting in a conference room, well, I mean, I guess bef not today, but because of the world, but imagine sitting down in a conference room and you have some executives and or architects and they brought me in to be like, help them move to the next step. And I genuinely ask who containerized this app and nobody gives me a straight answer. That is bonkers. But imagine like it happens. Was it your developers or was it your operations team? Was it, was there more than just a couple status meetings? <laughs> Asgard labs. I saw that happen a few times between the project teams. And when y'all shipped it, like you need to know the process of who containerized the thing. Yes. The promise of a containerization is a Docker container works, you know, anywhere the OCI is. But if you don't know who actually built the container and like what, pro what team was responsible for that, that's a, that's a really big red flag. <laughs> Next question. Why? <laughs> Seriously. Why did you containerize this app? Asgard Labs containerized it because they thought they were, that because they were told to. How many times have I been at co companies where they, they were just told they need to move forward? They need to move away from the technology stack they're on and move to something else. Not only for the re reason other than the execs needed to say that their core software stack was next gen. I've seen this happen with the bare metal to VM ecosystem. And it's happening again with the VM to con uh, containers ecosystem, where all of a sudden some CIO or CTO or CEO or read some magazine saying, containerization is the future. We all need to move there. And then, you know, a week later, they get off that plane and come back to the office and say, okay, we're not running VMware anymore or ES uh, EC2 or whatever. We're running containers. And they have no idea the amount of effort is why to move to that space. Like they don't see the advantages, only that it needs to be next gen. So something important to ask, why are we containerizing this? This one's a little bit more tricky. Where did you deploy or where are you planning on deploying this containerized app? The spurs from the conversation is around the cloud that you've chosen to use or the platform you've chosen to decide to use. Was the cloud we're using because of choice or because of an ELA, right? Was it the best one for the company or was this the cloud that we were forced to use? Was this the infrastructure we were forced to use? That's a real question to have. There are like, obviously I work at IBM and I believe IBM cloud has its advantages and there are certain spaces that IBM works really well in. But frankly speaking, as a developer advocate, I can say, you know, there are some really good things over on GCP. There are some really great things inside of Azure. And there are some really great things inside of AWS. As long as you're using OpenStack, please use OpenStack. To the point being another, trying to be funny. Um, but it's, it, in all seriousness, like, do you get to choose where you get to deploy your application to be able to fit your, your space and your business needs? Or are you just forced to use something? And that's, that one's, that one's tricky, especially with those, uh, those executives when you're sitting in that, that room asking, because they may have just signed a piece of paper and just assumed, eh, a cloud is a cloud is a cloud. That ain't true nowadays. <laughs> this is my favorite one. <laughs> what, what, what did we actually containerize? Do we actually know? <laughs> this comes from the actual architecture of what you've containerized. 
Asgar Labs, like, uh, frankly speaking, I saw this happen so often. Asgar Labs took a war file. Honestly, it could have been an ear file. And they thought all they had to do was shove it into the Docker container. Sorry, the Java Docker container, upstream Java Docker container, and called it a day. Wash their hands. Done. We're cloud native now. This opened up so many conversations I had with them. I still remember that the 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 call I was on when they were like, "Yeah, JJ, we're we're uh, we just shoved our our application into it, and now why is everything just sitting on one node and not across the three node cluster we have? Like we have, I'll get into deeper conversations about that in a little bit. I'll tell that story, but it's amazing to ask like." what is actually in the container and what is the advantage of doing that? So this takes a quick step back and let's take a look at some architectural changes that's going to have to happen as you walk down containerization and down into breaking up that monolithic application. So, oh, I am absolutely in the way. Give me a second here. And right up here, make myself a little smaller. There we go. So what happened there when they were talking about, oh, that is really bad. Give me a second. I'll make myself super small and just like hang out over here. How about that? Better? Perfect. So that the, the taking of the container, or sorry, taking of the WAR file, shoving it into a Docker container, and then pushing up on Kubernetes or OpenShift, you should be using OpenShift. Um, that is the replatform example. This is actually where a lot of companies think that's all they need to do. They just need to take their, of course I work at IBM, so WebSphere has to be somewhere. Another joke, hopefully somebody giggled. Um, take their WebSphere application, their le legacy app, have some middleware, shove it into the uh, WebSphere Liberty container, and then dump it up on, uh, on OpenShift. I mean, frankly speaking, that's what the promise teaches you. Right? Like this is what they say containerization is. But I, I'm, I'm here to tell you there's more. So after you get here, which is just the first step on the journey, you start thinking about repackaging everything into microservices. So instead of having one big WAR file that does the thing, you need to start thinking about all the different services around your application. So in this case, there's an ear file with a legacy with two WARs inside of it. And what have they done? They've repackaged their, um, their uh, IBM MQ, and then put two different WAR files on there. Now this could take you months to get to, I'm not gonna lie. Like this doesn't happen overnight. And that's another problem, is that when the bare metal to VM migration, frankly speaking, if you spent the time and effort, you could do it overnight. But with what's gonna happen here, there's gonna require a significant amount of engineering effort. And I'll get into that in here in a second. But if you see here, they take that replatform and now they expand it to a little bit farther. And then finally, the ultimate goal is the strangler pattern. If you've never heard of this term, basically it's the concept of breaking down your monolithic application, which our, 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 um, our uh, MC said earlier about, you know, breaking up your monolith into microservices. That was kind of my ult ultimate conversation. <laughs> I tried to have in this talk. So, uh, you know, spoilers and all that jazz. Um, but that's what this is, is you strangle down your application from a bunch of different WAR files or Python files. It doesn't matter. I just, I'm just using Java as an example here. And then you start cutting down your application into smaller and smaller microservice, uh, uh, microservices. So then all of a sudden, you have little bits and pieces of your application. And the beauty of using the strangler pattern too, which I'll talk about here in a moment in a deeper detail, is that you can run your, your microservice in parallel to your, your monolithic app. So you don't have to just go whole hog into it the, uh, the first time around. You can actually spend the time and effort, but we'll, we'll get into that here in a second. Does anyone have any questions or anything yet? So I'm just gonna give that a second while I fix my screen again here. Let me uh, fix my screen. I don't let it take a second for questions if there are any. Let's see, that should be about right. Oh, I did it again, didn't I? My bad. There we go, how about this? Better? Yeah, here we go. 
So, so let's talk about some um, the architectural advantages and disadvantages of going down this path, right? So we, we, we've, we've understood that replatforming is just a step. And, oh, awesome, thank you, Daniel. Um, so there's no questions quite yet, perfect. Uh, so, so as you've moved from your, from a re-platform, started moving towards um, your strangler pattern. So let's talk about those, the architectural advantages and disadvantages. First of all, the main, main advantage, simply said, is velocity. No joke. The ability to focus on your own histories and scoping of your clusters to what you actually need. One big pod isn't as good as a bunch of smaller pods. Whoever's telling you you should shove all your application into one pod on Kubernetes doesn't understand what containerization is. I've actually had e, um, enterprise architects saying, yeah, we just put everything in one pod and we shove it up on a Kubernetes container or Kubernetes cluster. And why, why can't we leverage to like everything? Because pods don't split across clusters. It, it just doesn't happen that way. The whole point is a pod is a, an entity. And the ability to focus on smaller pods with smaller uh, responsibilities, in some instance, microservices, then you'll be able to actually horizontally scale and then have your cluster to be what it actually needs, which in turn save you money instead of spending n number of thousands of dollars a month on a cluster that doesn't do anything, if that makes sense. But there's some disadvantages attached to this and simply said, this requires a higher level of cooperation. You'll need to build out more advanced integration tests. And frankly speaking, a completely different deployment and probably policy system. This is, this is a huge cultural change for your company. And a lot of people are scared of it when they start, start seeing these changes happen. So I didn't realize CCB wasn't a uh, uh, industry term. It was a term that I, I knew of when I worked at uh, Dell, Dell Technologies. Um, I live in Austin, Texas, so um, Dell is really big around here, so everyone works at Dell at some point in their career. And at Dell, they had something called the CCB, or the Change Control Board. And what do you mean, JJ, that our goal is to move away from this Change Control Board? Well, at Dell specifically, um, sorry, at a Asgar Lab subsidiary, that was a mistake, sorry. Um, you probably built an operations team or production team that goes through the CCB, right? They're the ones who actually hit the button to deploy the software um, or release the new WAR file to restart everything to do your, your, your monthly or biannually release. And you've actually seen, there's, there's a strong possibility that there are oh, before, you know, the world, there was this, probably this conference room where you had your dev team, your dev manager, your QA manager, your production manager, your VP, all say go, no go, right? Like we've all seen that, like do the thumbs up thing. Well, believe it or not, this still exists today <laughs> in some form or another at the companies I've worked for, where I've asked like, how do you deploy stuff? They're like, oh, we have a monthly meeting or a weekly meeting about different JIRAs that have been agreed upon and we ship them. And I'm just like, this is so dumb. But okay, cool. <laughs> and people find comfort around this, right? Like they know that they, everybody says, yes, we can deploy this thing. So moving into the cloud native ecosystem, there's a possibility of you deploying multiple times a day with multiple different, you know, changes to your microservices because the ultimate goal is to break things down to smaller batches, right? Just like they do, they talk about in Ilyahu Goldratt's um, The Goal or uh, Gene Kim's uh, Phoenix Project, small batch changes are the way to move quickly. And small batch changes in the CCB just don't work. They don't. It's that simple. Um, you're not going to have director level people sitting in a conference room for every single deployment you hit, when you hit that big green uh, merge to main, they're not gonna sit there and say, yes, you can make that change. Yes, they're gonna make that change. Like that's just not gonna happen. You're gonna have to trust and build 
trust into the system to do that. But I'll get into that deeper here in a second. Hey, hey, JJ, um, are we doubling up on things? I hear there's this whole ecosystem around OpenShift or Kubernetes. And like, why do I have this like load balancer now in my data center? Like, isn't there a load balancer built inside of Kubernetes? Like, why, why, like databases? Like, why do I need a database here and uh, over there now? Like, this feels weird. And honestly, yeah, you're gonna need to audit and verify that you aren't doubling up on your technology or your work. Believe it or not, you gotta do your homework here. A great example was um, one of the Asgard Labs uh, subsidiary had a, a scheduler built inside their Java stack, right? So they would, they would spin out like batch jobs from their application. And the, they had a schedule built into the application, but the problem is, is because the application spun out the, the sub processes inside the pod, right? Um, so they would have this pod that was running their application all just in one thing. They'd spin it out it's a, as a batch job, but because a pod can't cross, plus, or can't, can't cross nodes, all of a sudden, one node would just spike in, in, in usage, and the other, cluster, the other nodes would just sit there, do nothing. I asked, I was like, well, you know you have two more, two more nodes sitting just doing nothing. Why don't you leverage the, the Kubernetes scheduler to schedule these things? So your application like, spins up another pod with that little batch job inside of it, maybe you know microservices, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, that's amazing. And yeah, all of a sudden now, instead of you having one node that was doing all the heavy lifting and slowing down all the other um, requests coming to it, now it just spins up a bunch of different microservices. It gets dumped off to nodes that aren't neat, are, are basically idle, which allows our users downstream to be able to be more effective. This was great, right? Like this is, this is leveraging the technology for what it does. But they had to see it. They had to understand that they needed to audit their work and understand that maybe the way they built that application isn't the correct way to spit and sit inside of um, in the cloud native ecosystem. So isn't, a, isn't automation good here? And again, I am covering myself. I'm gonna make myself smaller. There we go. And uh, <laughs> why is everything so complicated now? <laughs> Well, first of all, of course, automation is good here, right? Like that's, <laughs> you're not, you're not going to have your CCB or your director sit around that table and give you thumbs up every single time. You need to leverage automation. With all the moving parts, you're going to need to leverage some type of, some type of automation around it because humans are error prone and you need to let the bots do the work for you. You need to take the humans out of the equation. You need to trust the bots to do the work for you. And honestly, it's all your app has probably always been this 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 complicated, like frankly speaking. But unfortunately, only like your enterprise architect and maybe your senior developers ever understood how complicated it was, right? You've probably never been able to visualize the complexity when it comes to your application because it's been hidden behind a bunch of different functions and, and features of your application as it's just one more file or. However, you do, again, I'm using WAR files like a catch-all. It could be an exe. It doesn't matter. It's just one monolithic app. But now because you've broken your thing up into microservices or you move towards a cloud-native space, all of a sudden your application is this massive, massive spider web of, of interconnectivity. You're going to have to start leveraging stuff. When you truly get to microservices, you'll be amazed on how much information you actually get out of seeing your application out in the space. In a great way, and a great quote from a friend of mine, Rob Kidd, basically said it this way, is when you have a um, um, monolithic app, you have a ornery bull mastiff. Like it's a big, big dog. But now you have 13 yipping chihuahuas because you have 13 little dogs that are just yipping away. They're all dogs still, right? They all require care and feeding, but no longer do you have this one really big dog you have to take care of, and you have to take care of 13 yipping chihuahuas. It's a weird kind of great paradigm switch. 
where you're all of a sudden, it's easier to take small care of a small yipping chihuahua. You can pick it up and move it around if you need to and not worry about the third. Well, you should probably worry about the 12 other ones, but you get the point. Instead of you having to pick up one big bull mastiff to do something with it, take it to the vet, take it to a walk, whatever. So it allows you to have that kind of paradigm where you can make easier changes to smaller things. But to layer it on top of that, to quote another great friend of mine in marriage, Margaret, I can never say his last name correctly. Um, we replaced our monolith with microservices and every, every outage is now a murder mystery. Ken stole this from someone who stole this from someone who I've stolen from Ken. But it's true. On the flip side, if something goes wrong, just as Ken stole this quote, it really does hit home. Now it really becomes a murder mystery. Take a moment and think about that. No longer can you, no longer unless you have aggregated logging and monitoring, every log will be unique for each microservice. So you have to walk through each process and what it did when. It'll actually force you to sit down and, and, and roll back and understand why that outage happened, why that microservice broke, or why that microservice couldn't talk to that random JSON endpoint or whatever, or REST endpoint, it doesn't really matter. So you have to actually start placing and, and playing, be, basically becoming Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> but in turn, this will end up forcing you to create standardized logging and the ability to roll information up in a, in a correct way. And I'll get deeper into that here in just a second. So let's talk about some questions you should ask about when this culture shift will happen. I mentioned that CCB earlier, and at Asgard Labs, the CCB became something of almost like what the Phoenix Project had, as I mentioned earlier. No one showed up. They sort of, they sort of showed up. They said yes and go, no go. It, was, it wasn't engaging. If anything, it was a burden, right? With moving to cloud native, you'll naturally have to start building self-orchestration inside of it. You have to start trusting your, your engineers and your, your, um, the bots to do the work for you. So self-orchestration for rollouts and updates. All of a sudden now you, you say, hey, if the build is green and we know our integration test has gone correctly, there's no reason why I can't hit this merge to master or merge to main and get this new feature set pushed out. Like, I mean, obviously you're gonna have to work with the different teams to do, make sure that all everyone's happy about that. But at that point, then now you're just worrying about features. You're no longer about worrying about the build. Of course, now, you know, when the build breaks, that dunce hat's gonna have to go on somebody, but it's important to, to recognize. You'll lean more and more on pipelines and collaboration to get the different widgets out that you need at the right time. And that's really important because you're absolutely gonna need a pipeline. Like you're going to need to use some, some type of CI and CD. With a cultural shift that happens, you'll start building more intelligent pipelines built for CI and CD. So continuous integration is easy. Continuous delivery is the real challenge. You'll need to leverage the standards of linting so you can always make sure that you, you have a standardized version of code out there. Like if you're in Python, standardize on PEP8, sure, or whatever, or the d trillion different versions of JavaScript uh, standardizations out there. So you don't spend that time working with that overhead. One reason why Go, Go the Golang is so specifically easy to read from an operation standpoint, which I am, I'm an, I'm an old sysadmin, right? Like I even got the gray beard. I'm an old sysadmin. But one reason why I like reading Go is because out of the box came the Go format command. They didn't need, they, they said this is the standard of how to write Go code. This is so important for when things go horribly wrong for operations people. No longer at 3 a.m., they're not arguing over where the parentheses or the tabs versus spaces. Because believe it or not, there's cognitive overhead of doing that at three in the morning when you're trying to figure out what went wrong. But if you've all decided that it's just gonna be spaces instead of tabs, we're gonna use the go format command to make sure it's always this way or pep eight, now we can start thinking about the logic of the application instead of the syntax. And that small thing right there 
of using linting, injecting that in your pipeline earlier on, earlier on with your application as you move to microservices will save you insane amounts of time when you actually get to production. So hopefully that, get across, uh, that got across. You also learn to, to collaborate with other teams. How many times have I actually been on a call with multiple teams at a higher level at a corporation that didn't even knew that they knew they existed, but never actually talked to them? Ah, so Nor Norbert, you asked, is there a transformation also? Oh, there's a couple questions in here. Um, transformation also possible with a monolith that has, say, five different apps, uh, third party apps as an interpret. Well, yeah, Norbert, of course. The, the, this transformation is absolutely possible today, but you need to start breaking it down into um, smaller and smaller chunks. Like you can't boil the ocean, right? Like that's another important thing that hopefully this talk gets across is that you cannot boil the ocean. You have to start understanding and decoupling the different, um, in your case, five different applications so they can work, work separately. And then when they can work separately and they have a third party upstream or downstream, Maybe focus on decoupling from that. So, I mean, obviously I don't know what your application does or what it, what it has, but you start segre uh, um, segregating your applications into safe, safe spaces. And then, believe it or not, by creating those, those walls, you're in essence creating containers, even if they are just log logical. You haven't physically turned it into a container yet, but if you can understand where those boundaries are, then breaking it up into a container is much easier. And then you can start building it smaller and smaller. Norbert, I hope I answered your question. Uh, Daniel, you put a rather large question of, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the question is, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, yes, so the, 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 hopefully this gets across at the end of my talk. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges here is, uh, the interdependency and back to the, the murder mystery, believe it or not. This actually, it gets kind of covered with that because all of a sudden now that you have all these different microservices talking to one another, there's, there's an actual latency. The computer, computers, like we still can't break physics, right? Like intercommunication between microservices uh, has the, has, still is held down by the wires that can, can interconnect your computers. Well, one of the only things that I can say, and of course this really, it really is a, it depends because there's so many variables here, is you leverage, when you break your, your monolithic up, app up into, excuse me for a second. When you break up your monolithic app into microservices, you try to make sure that as much can be still on the same cluster as possible. So of course, you know, you have um, your upstream and downstream services that you might need to talk to, but you need to, you need to architect your microservices to be as close to one another as possible for those latency issues. Did I answer your question, Daniel? I'll, I'll let you respond. Um, maybe? Possibly? Um, well, 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 if, perfect, thank you. So um, let's take a quick back, take a step back and talk about collaboration with other teams. Believe it or not, this becomes a huge issue uh, while you're moving towards those microservices. The hardest thing I saw at Asgard Labs, believe it or not, was the deal to actually collaborate with other teams. Back to that phone call or those calls or WebExes or Zooms or whatever you want to call it that I had with these corporations, these different teams knew about each other, but they never talked, right? Like they just didn't. They only talked because a third party like an IBMer was coming in. So like, oh, IBM is coming in. We can, we can talk and have a communication. But I was basically a therapist, to be brutally honest. They had some great propaganda about how they had a scrum team going back and forth and tribes and whatnot. But people just kept doing things the old way. They would just toss the Jira ticket over the corner. Uh, uh, Patrick, I just saw your question and I will answer it here momentarily. I want to get across that with collaborating with other teams, Collaboration isn't just status meetings. As much as you think it might just be your project manager might tell you, hey, what are you doing? Let's uh, have a stand-up every day. That's not collaboration. That's them being able to report something into probably an Excel spreadsheet or a Gantt chart somewhere, which is not 
not working, doesn't work in the cloud native space. Again, you need to trust self orchestration to be truly successful. You need to declare shared contracts between different teams. Like that project manager shouldn't be asking about tickets anymore. They should be working with the other project managers that the other, other microservices team to agree that when you send a post request to this endpoint, you expect these four features inside of the JSON blob or something like that. You expect this to come back or you expect always to have this endpoint as your health check endpoint. I don't know. It doesn't matter. The point I'm trying to get is, is no longer is it tracking tasks. It's now building shared contracts between, between teams. Jira tickets can only get you so far. But the most successful thing I ever saw, believe it or not, at Asgard Labs, and this, this happened at one company, and unfortunately, they still have not given me permission to actually talk, to them, talk publicly about this. But every single sprint, they would take one person from each team they had and switch it to another team. So they would randomly choose someone in, 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 in the little team that was working on whatever feature, and they would pick them up, or what if, metaphorically pick them up, and then move them to another team. Now, this had to come, in, this had to come down from the, the executive standpoint, right? Like, you need executives to buy in on this, because initially, your, your, uh, your production and your feature sets are going to just come grinding to a halt. But after the second or third sprint, so every two weeks, now we had two week sprints. Uh, so after the, maybe the sixth week of doing this total, all of a sudden their velocity skyrocketed. Because imagine every two weeks you have new blood coming into your team and telling you, asking you how to get, a, get something done or understand how that feature is written to do that thing or how to extend that feature of your little skill, of your little, of your little thing or your widget. Your documentation has to become better. Because you can't spend two days trying to get a brand new person working with you, right? Like you, 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 have to, you have to build better documentation. You have to understand that no longer is it tribal knowledge to understand X, Y, and Z. And who knows, maybe that person who just came onto your team came from another team you're working or that you need to interface with and they're an expert in that space. So now instead of you having to reach out to that other team, they're sitting there right beside you. Or I mean, beside you again. Again, I'm imagining an office here, but you get the point. It requires a massive level of cooperation. But now all of a sudden, knowledge is shared by just every two weeks, you learn something brand new. Also, that really helped with retention because now every single engineer had another space that they could learn something brand new. And you know, if you didn't want to move, of course you work with your, your team to make sure it doesn't move and all that jazz. But it was a great experiment that actually got them to, want to, to, to skyrocket their, their production. I really wish I could really talk about the actual company, but know the story does exist and this experiment is successful. All right, I'm so sorry, I need to speed up. We are getting close to time here. Um, so with, with every, with every, uh, every um, cloud native speak or cloud native talk, you need to think about Visibility and monitoring, it is actually really, really important. No longer can you just buy one product, Nagios, that does all your monitoring for you. As much as, as much as I hate to say it, Nagios is still out there. And no longer can you just buy Nagios to take care of your, your infrastructure. Also, there's other companies that I can't say publicly because I have partnerships with them, that they might sell you that they can do all this stuff. And I disagree. You cannot just have a one pane of glass to look into the cloud native ecosystem. You're gonna need multiple tools to be able to see where the different things are important. You're gonna need everything from your APMs to understand how your application is running inside your cluster to your cluster visibility to that one graph that you're gonna put inside your marketing and or sales team that's always going up and to the right until it goes down and then they will immediately be at your desk asking why is that graph going down? That's a joke. I actually had that one at one point in my career. Um, but it's true. Like you're going to need different levels of visibility and monitoring and one cannot do it all. And you have to spend the time and effort to figure out what you need to wear. But start small and then build up over time. 
you need to take a moment and recognize that the economics of the cloud is completely different than the data center. As much as we all know, um, the whole advantage of the cloud is that you can just buy it with a credit card. Well, that's great for, for um, shadow IT. But when you start bringing your CFOs and your, your finance teams, that's actually a problem. They really do have a problem with the cloud and how cloud native works because now they can't depreciate this stuff, right? Like that's actually a really big problem. A lot of CFOs leverage depreciation of hardware or that type of space in, in, their, in their, their, um, their balance sheets. And if everything turns into OPEX or operational expense and no longer CAPEX, that's actually a, a rough conversation to have. So be sure to be, pay attention and hopefully your managers are talking to your finance people about this stuff. So they understand the budgeting is completely different. Finance people are your friends. You should absolutely keep them in the loop about what's happening because they're the ones who make sure that, you know, regulatory people don't come after you. I say this kind of jokingly, but it's true. What do you mean all our support is now on Stack Overflow? Well, honestly, yeah. <laughs> in the cloud native space, it's, it's true. <laughs> like, of course, IBM, you know, Red Hat and uh, Microsoft and AWS have support contracts too. But as you get deeper into the cloud native space, you'll actually start leveraging the community more. And jokingly true, like you're going to have to talk to Stack Overflow. You're going to have to put some, to some things out there. And that's, that's scary to some, some executives out there because now you don't have a throat to choke. But if you leverage something like OpenShift out there and you leverage like Red Hat, um, there are experts that they spend there. You, you can give them money and they will be there to help you when things go pear-shaped. But keep that in mind. So let's talk about some actual tangible things as I wrap this conversation up with you that you can do to hopefully become more successful. There's a ton of technology and software to help you get going, but I actually stay, stay away from that initially. The best thing you can do is to realize and take a moment and figure out if and when you containerized your app, did you really containerize it or was it some other team? Did you just wrap up some application to a pod and call it a day? Like, you need to understand the scope of the investment of containerization you did. And you need to understand if there's places and in, in, in spaces you can, you can start shaving off your monolithic app to microservices, leveraging that strangler pattern. You need to have that large conversation with your teams on why you did this. Was it just because you didn't want to get left behind by Asgard Labs? Or is it because you thought you could leverage some new bit of software that could be beneficial to your, your, your downstream customers. Remember, you're building software for your customers. It's not just because you can just build software. You need to make some money. So the advantage of this is you need to figure out why you're doing it. So the conclusion, and ideally where you can go from here, is with masking all these corporations as Asgard Labs, hopefully it's helped highlight some of the different consistencies you saw. Again, I wish I could name these companies, of course, but I can't. The best thing you can do, or really the best thing you can do, is first ask, do you really need to? <laughs> like, I've, if you're already in the black making money and you're sitting on VMs, like I'm using Tomcat on ESXi, as, as much as I am as, as a cloud native person and I want you to use IBM Cloud and use our IKS or OpenShift offering, but if you're making money, the amount of time and effort is for you to replatform onto cloud native probably isn't a good idea. How about you do your next application as cloud native? You know, like the next thing you need to build, do that as cloud native. Don't, don't migrate. Believe it or not, that's what this talk is about is do your homework, right? If you've already committed going down the, the, the path, you probably need to take a beat and look for optimizations and, and instead of features. This will drive your teams crazy, but re-platform or turning your monolithic app into microservices or to cloud native is a, is a massive investment. The more you pay up front though, and use the correct tool for the job, the better you'll be. Or as to simply put it, as my buddy Thomas Kate said, you wouldn't need use a saw when you needed a hammer or a hammer when you needed a saw, right? Just 
picture that in your mind for a moment. I mean, sure, I can use a hammer or I can use a saw to hammer in a nail. I'll look like an idiot, but it'll work. Or I can use a hammer to break a piece of wood in half. I mean, I'll look like an idiot, <laughs> but it'll work. So be sure to use your, the right tool for the right job and do your homework. Thank you so much. Again, JJ Asgar, uh, awesome at IBM.com. Hopefully uh, you all enjoyed this. Absolutely. Thank you, JJ. It's very insightful. Thank you. <laughs> and the question, the question is, uh, sure. speaking of, you know, why shouldn't we re-platform, uh, you know, go native when it's not needed? I mean, from your experience, do you remember any valid uh, use cases when people did it right and uh, then well, the not so valid ones when they <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> you don't have so... to you don't have to provide names no worries but yeah. we just want to learn from practical <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah so the the short of it is is i usually came into conversations because i'm a cloud native person i'm, I'm an infrastructure sysadmin person like I, I play a developer on tv but you know i i spend more time at a bash prompt than i do like inside of an ide if that makes sense and when I usually come to conversations, it's usually because they were spending too much money on cloud and not understood why. And, or they were trying to, they, they tried to move into uh, Kubernetes and they were running from a monolithic app running on a VM to that space. And I came in only seeing the, the pain, right? And the pain that I saw over and over and over is these conversations is because they don't, they're not successful. Right, like yes, you can shove your container, you can shove your WAR file, as I keep saying, or your your Python file or or your your exe into a container and put it on Kubernetes and call it a day, but you're going to have downstream problems. Successful ones, though, on the flip side, and this is not me saying as an IBMer or as an IBMer who runs Red Hat, but as an actual engineer, the actual successful ones I've seen is when they've completely abstracted away the infrastructure, right where all of a sudden infrastructure doesn't matter anymore because all they have is in essence an API to deploy your application. So going back to like the Heroku world or the Cloud Foundry world, right? And believe it or not, OpenShift, which is the enterprise version of, of Kubernetes for, from Red Hat, is that space. Because all of a sudden as a developer, you don't care about what's going on inside the infrastructure. You don't care about the cluster at all. You just have this OC apply command, or like you hit a button and it, it does a, a webhook whenever you push a new thing to main or master on GitHub, and it just deploys your app and you say, fuck it, I'm done. Like that's, from a developer standpoint, that's what you want because you want to spend your time with your application, not dealing with the intricacies of Kubernetes. Did I answer your question? Definitely. And there is a thank you, JJ. It was awesome from Daniel. <laughs> I'm thank sure you. many other people feel the same. As we do. <clears throat> right. And there is um there is another one. Uh do you oh, but but I think you already tackled this uh, this question for the multi threading services of failed uh, yeah. this uh, one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, that again. That's that's very like specific and like it really depends on how your application is designed yeah. and, and developed. Like it's it's I, I can't I can't answer that question unfortunately because I, I don't I don't know your application. <laughs> no, it's a lot of specifics. And coming back to the earlier discussion, you need to consider all scenarios. And uh, I think once to decide whether you want to go to microservices, even after you go there, there are a lot of things to be considered how you do them. Just as an example, if you think about uh, shared functionalities between uh, microservices, you can do it in a numerous ways. Which one will you choose? There's no answer. It yeah. really depends. That statement we all love and hate at the same time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. what, what always interesting is that, uh, I mean, you would expect the technical things would be the hardcore stuff. But well, that's not entirely true. I mean, it's how you organize the teams and, and it's more, always much more than the technical thing. 
what's the joke is that um, you have the beginner developer who wants to use just an if then statement. You have the mid-level engineer who wants to use a case statement. And then the senior engineer is just like, fuck it, I'll do an if then statement. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So I, I, I think this, this concludes our day, right? The first Indeed. day of the one with design and architecture. It's been a, well, really, really insightful day uh, for us and for, for the audience. And then thank you, JJ, and thank you, everyone, for, for uh, joining us and, uh, uh, you know, being part of these conversations. JJ, we're really looking forward to, to uh, having you next time uh, at CodeCamp, hopefully sometime soon and also in person at some point. I mean, well, let's hope stuff in this world gets more normal. I agree. And I, I would. I'd love to be on a plane to come see y'all. Um, I, I, I actually have been told Bucharest is um, one of the best cities on the planet by a buddy I grew up with, and he's like, JJ, one day you need to be there with me, and I'm like, yeah. I need to find a be reason to be in Romania. I just, I just need well, to be there. Let's make it happen. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Thank you again, JJ. It's been a pleasure having you here.